Are you in the cars? Uh, I don't mind, yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. I learned to drive in Land Rover, age seven. Did you? Yeah. yeah. It's a farm, in the, uh, in the Yeah. Leafy, leafy hills of North Pembrokeshire, aged seven. Mm. Mm. You sit on the edge of the seat and you look underneath the steering wheel, because the steering wheel is a massive of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fellas, I think this might be the first episode of After the Bell we've actually recorded. After the Bell. After the Bell. <laughs> so this is the first week that we're not lying to you. Welcome. Episode 13 of Taking Stock After the Bell. Um, we are joined this week by Mr. Charlie Parnell. Um, Charlie used to be an investment manager and partner at LGT Vestra and was previously an associate director at UBS, but he is now the founder of Money Guided, which we'll get you to talk about in a second, Charlie. Um, he also used to work with me and Johnny, so he knows where the bodies are buried. Uh, so be nice, mate. <laughs> um, so how's life as a how's life as a founder in the fintech industry? Yeah, I mean, every minute is uh, is a bundle of fun. Um, but no, it's it's generally pretty exciting. I definitely feel alive. Um, you know, you, you go from an environment where you know markets go up and down, and clients come and go, and the challenges yeah. are there. Managing people, as we were just touching on a moment ago is always you know fun or not as the case may be sometimes um but that relative security into mm. um a, a completely different environment where pretty much everything is is on you as an individual and yeah i mean kind of care for what you wish for but i took the plunge and yeah here we are brilliant um do you want to tell us a little bit about money guided and, and what you're trying to achieve there yeah, so I suppose the genesis of the idea really was in my job in wealth management, investment management, um, I had moved a little bit more into a management type role as opposed to just being client facing. And I started to think more and more about how it must be possible to use modern technology and maybe slightly different ways of working to make a 21st century investment management business more accessible to more people at lower cost, but ideally at the same time more profitable for the organization actually providing the service. And the more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, the more I researched what I thought the problem was, it became increasingly apparent to me that the problem wasn't so much how do you make investment management and access to investments easier for more people as something perhaps much more fundamental for most people in this country that they just don't have money to invest. So um, so that was the, the original genesis of the idea and you know, encountered a few people in technology and, and different things that were going on. And what we have spent the last three and a bit years doing is building a an app, so a digital based proposition um, aimed at helping the person on the street get basically better financial outcomes. So it's not just you've got a few quid that you might want to invest. Here's QC or yeah. LGT or Nutmeg. It, it's aimed at, it's a much broader proposition um, trying to help people. Is, is investment uh, even right for you? Are there a few actions that we need to take before we think well, about but, that? I mean, yeah, and I'm sure we'll get into, into some of the stats. Um, uh, at some point this afternoon but the reality is most people in this country won't get anywhere near investing whether it's through a firm like this or even through a Vanguard, Vanguard type platform because they do not have excess capital. The idea of turning excess, or sorry, they don't, they don't have <coughs> excess income to turn into capital. Um, so whilst we've had auto enrolments and people most people now have pensions mm. f for very many that'll be about as close as they ever get to investing in the way that we would think about sitting here or in, a, in my previous role. I, th I mean, there's obviously the resource issue that people don't have the excess money. Um, there are a lot of people who just aren't engaged with the world at all and don't even think about investing. I mean, how much of it do you think is about education versus you know having the disposable yeah. necessarily to put the work? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I'd, I'd sort of pull the camera back a bit further even and say it's not even about engaging with investing or thinking about investing. I, I don't think well, I think a lot of people are just fundamentally not engaged with money, full stop, and their financial situation, full stop. Um, a lot of people just sort of go from paycheck to paycheck, and until recently, I, I guess most people would have been in a 
reasonable position and being able to do that increasingly yeah. cost of living crisis for, for many people that's becoming harder and harder as well so um but yeah education is hugely important you don't know what you don't know and it's not part of the core, hasn't been part of the core curriculum i think back to my, my experience with money and having been a, a a financial professional for over 20 years um I, I guess i was fortunate that i was exposed to money and education about money and what have you but i look back at some of the things that i did in my 20s straight out of university ludicrous you know getting getting the credit card and loading it up because it's interest free on purchase and then yeah. you, you, you you don't set up the direct debit to pay the bill every month or you let that 0% roll over and you can still afford the 100 quid a month to pay it off. But, yeah, but you don't realise you're getting stung on the on the interest. Yeah. Right, because you go from paying off 100% principal to 98% interest. And, and and if you get caught in that trap, then it takes years and years to pay it off. But I so say you don't know what oh, you don't know. No, of course. I, I remember getting a call from my mum in the first year of university and she'd given me, bless her, a credit card to go and spend food on money and things and the essentials she was absolutely irate david what is tiger tiger (laughs) (laughs) done the whole lot on a monday night um but you know even in happy hour even in happy hour yeah exactly um i think there's a couple of elements here like we're not taught about it i think there's a danger potentially because we work in the finance industry we assume that people and i've been guilty of this with clients and people and prospects of assuming that people are as interested in finance Mm. as i am yeah it's like I, the most engaging I, topic occasion yeah. <laughs> but i think for, for many people money and investing and markets and so on are really dull topics and the closest people a lot of people get to it is the the, the alarmist news on or the, the alarmist headline on the news you know billions wiped off the value of shares mm-hmm. what have you. And for most people the FTSE etc I mean, what is that they just you know we you don't you don't get taught about it um as I said, I think I think people just are not engaged with it because it is boring. And I think there's also a very lazy assumption in society that you you go to school, you might go to university, you might not go to university. Hopefully, you get a job, you know, and you're out in the big bad world. And people know what income tax is, or national insurance yeah. is, or how you go about buying a house, or what a mortgage is, or how what you know what is APR, and all this sort of, you know all this sort of jargony type stuff that, frankly, a lot of money professionals don't necessarily nope. know the nuts and bolts of or, or, or what have you. And um, there's a lazy assumption in society that people just know how money mm. works, how finance works, and that's not true. And secondly, um, and this is partly a bit of that radicalization I was talking about before, James, but as an industry, financial services and financial products have not got a particularly good track record of making things simple and transparent and mm. understandable. We use a lot of jargon. It's shrouded and what have you. The T's and C's are, mm-hmm. you know, I've not, I actually have seen your T's and C's. And of course, they are long and detailed because they have to be mm-hmm. to protect the client, to protect the firm. But this is impenetrable stuff. And all the guy wanting a motor insurance policy of money supermarket or a new credit card, whatever it is, can I get a credit card or can I get that loan? The rest of it is like, just he's, noise. He's, he's not interested in Hammer than Ailey. He wants to put the picture in the wall. You know, ultimately, he's not he's not interested in what's going on underneath the bonnet. Exactly. Um, so there, there, are, there are quite a few things going on. And it's not that people are stupid. It's just, you just don't get told this. Well, there's two, there's two, it's not necessarily being stupid. This is an analogy, an analogy I've used quite a lot in the past. It's not necessarily being stupid. We all instinctively know what we should be doing. We shouldn't be going out spending money on things that we don't need and overspending our income. Doing that and sticking to it and having a sensible investment strategy and sticking to it is really, really, really difficult. Like, I know that if I want to lose a few kilos, I should probably lay off the pints, the burgers, mm. and exercise more. But that can be difficult to do on a consistent basis. Well, and yeah, you know, you're sort of getting into the, the behavioural side of things and cognitive bias and, mm. and um, heuristics and what have you. Yes, I think instinctively a lot of people do know what a good thing or not a good thing to do is. Certainly when it comes to physical health, I suspect in financial health and making financial decisions, actually, I think it's compounded by that, what we would consider to be common sense and good practice, good yeah. housekeeping. I generally don't think exists 
in large sections of the population. And so, so people, sorry, James, I'll be, people either instinctively make bad decisions because we're pre-programmed to make mm -hmm. quick, easy, snap decisions, or worse, a lot of people just don't make decisions at all. Yeah, no, it's the worst bit. Sorry. And, and does this go back to, does this go back to school that the education system is not the, you know, we See, we, we shouldn't be learning, you know, certain subjects, and instead we should be learning a bit more around personal finance. You know, how a mortgage works. Well, something what APR something is. would be a start, yeah. I think, and um, you know whether you know, sh should should the average eighteen year old know how to calculate APR? Probably not, mm. but they should understand that uh, that if you're what paying interest on yeah. something, that it can rack up. So whilst money on that interest free credit card feels like it's it's free, mm. and you know, and the people that can get access to interest free credit cards are in a very different boat to the people who are going to a loan company or a credit card company that is charging 50% or yeah. whatever it may be and the impact of that. So I think, who was I talking to yesterday? Someone was talking about their kid and their maths homework and mm. how difficult maths seems to be these days for eight, nine, 10, 15 year old kids, whatever. Um, I th think that things could definitely be done differently yeah. and offering a little bit more practical assistance like quadratic, quadratic equations and cosine and trigonometry like brilliant stuff but actually if you don't understand how credit card interest works or how a mortgage works yeah. like, what's the point so yeah. I think yeah. yeah but educationally I think they could do more specifically around finance and they could also roll everyday life skills including how money works into the broader curriculum mm. probably um, you've mentioned the need, and we've touched upon this a couple. It's sort of been a running theme of the podcast over the last, crikey, what is it, six months or so mm. now. UK economy obviously is under a bit of pressure, and the average Joe blogs in the street, including us all, is under a wee bit of pressure. We've got some, we've got some charts on that. Um, obviously, mortgage <coughs> rates have exploded mm. higher. Um, this chart is from friend of the show Mike Bell at JP Morgan. Uh, this is the percentage of households that are struggling to afford their rent or mortgage <coughs> payments. Yeah. And the one on the right hand side is is the rent here. And these are all telling a similar a similar story. There's accumulation of debt, not only uh not only regular debt but unsecured debt as well. Yeah. See um, this this chart here is quite interesting in that I think that that trough there is twenty one. Yeah. Sort of mid Q two twenty one maybe. Yeah. And I think what we saw during the COVID period was that people couldn't go out and do stuff and there wasn't much to buy, um, which you know, I guess feeds into the interest rate and inflation mm -hmm. argument to an mm -hmm. extent. But, mm -hmm. but I think there was a period where people were paying down those debts. And now, as we've seen, the, the backlash is that, and this chart, you know, it would be interesting to see what this chart was pre Q1 2020. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, and that, that curve looks to me like it's getting steeper and the evidence is there that more and more people are relying on credit cards to pay their everyday bills and yeah. to pay for their, their shop, their food shopping, you know, those non-discretionary items. And people are using debt to do it, which is increasingly expensive debt to be. And your point is that you're trying to educate people about that debt is available to you, yes, but it doesn't necessarily, there is a cost to taking that on, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to come across as overly hair shirt or puritanical but that I've, 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 I think I recall I wrote a blog piece when I was at, at Vestra about um, cash machines and then the advent of consumer credit and what have you and you now think of things like Klarna among you know, mm. you know, that sort of <clears throat> buy now pay later type mentality the good old-fashioned way of doing things you'd save up to go on that holiday we'd save up to buy that car and Perhaps we'll talk a bit about automotive as well, but society, certainly in the Western world, broadly speaking, is now very highly tuned to, well, I want it and I want it now, and the facilities there to get it now. Yeah. And <coughs> people the economy, the economy has an incentive to sell you things now. Companies have an incentive to sell you things now. They don't want you to wait six months. They want you to go and, and buy it on tech. Essentially, and yeah. It's not. It's not. You know. It's not individuals' fault or like a fault of discipline that 
because it's being drilled into you that you need to buy this thing and you need to buy it now because that's what represents success and and yeah and and yeah there, there, there are a lot of i'm not sure we've got the time this evening to to go into it fully but this, this sort of combination of things of being you know, People want to do stuff because it's immediately available, mm. and the facility is there to make it be immediately available. And this sort of deferred gratification is not really a thing. And goodness knows that's how I've lived my life. I mean, going back to what I was saying in my twenties, I mean, essentially my strategy for life was <clears throat> was to fund my twenties based on projected future earnings. And broadly mm. speaking, you managed it. it. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I was lucky enough to be in an industry where, yeah. you know. You start off by not earning very much, and if you do a good job and you look after clients and you get more clients and you get a fair wind of capital markets behind you, particularly fueled as, as it has been through our, throughout our careers, basically mm. by free money. Um, you know, it, as a strategy, it worked out. Yeah. But I wouldn't necessarily say to every graduate coming out of university into their first job, spend what you like in your twenties because don't worry, it'll be right in your thirties and forties. Because I'm not so sure that that's necessarily true. Not with rates sitting where they are. No. Student loan debt. No. Those prices would be the, the Although, two things. you know, I think back to my, my early career and Bank of England base rate was at 6%. I can't remember exactly, but it was like clockwork for month after month after month for the first, basically, whatever it would have been, five, six years of my career pre financial crisis, rates Cotton were rates. at 6%. Mm. Just stuck at yeah. six, yeah. And then, you had the great financial crisis, and I think it was March '09. Rates went down to whatever it was, one or mm. seventy-five, whatever it was, and and they stuck at that level for a long time. Combined with QE, of course. Um, but for a lot of people, investors, a lot of people working in in this this type of mm. business would have experienced nothing other than basically free money. Yeah. The one of the things, one of the knock-on impacts, and you know, we started working together at the beginning of that period when rates were ultra low in the conversation that you you always had fund managers coming in and saying, this is going to lead to hyperinflation, and it never arrived. And the difference this time around is we've had the inflation mm. probably due to the fiscal, well, definitely due to the fiscal stimulus. You mentioned the cost of living. And it's difficult sometimes to get a sense of inflation because you just see one number every you know year on year changes and johnny you threw this chart into the pack which is all right it's america rather than the uk but it's the year over year trend and while the year over year number the 12 month change number the black line goes down that doesn't mean the prices are materially going lower they are still at that level so things haven't got necessarily all that more affordable for people no and and you know that will then feed that base effect will feed through into what the rate of inflation is a year from now and we've already started to see some of these inflation prints it would be very interesting to see what what the next print is um and for the next x months my, my personal view is that that we will see some quite big drop-offs from because that because of that base effect but to your point dave if a pint of milk was a pound last year and it's a pound ten now, for the sake of argument, it's still a pound ten. It's hardly been cheaper. No, but you would also expect there to be some wage inflation. There is a little bit of wage inflation coming through, so that affordability comes back. But what one thing we were talking about uh, in our office earlier, and I, I wish I'd asked you to dig it up actually, is that since the Second World War, in particular, that the, the sort of default assumption has been that there will be that prices go up, that there is inflation, and at, at points there have been periods of greater inflation, lesser inflation. Mm. I'm, you know, I remember <clears throat> back early in my career, Eddie George having the ignominy of having to write to the mm. Chancellor of the Exchequer about why the bank had missed their inflation target because, what was it, two and a half and it come in at 2.3 or something, mm. or two. Um, Mervyn, Mervyn King was doing it, wasn't he? Uh, uh, I think King came after George from memory, but, yeah, was, but, but I'm, I'm, sure, same, yeah. I'm sure Mervyn King had to as well. Um, but I'm always quite interested by the the longer term inflation, say back three hundred years pre agricultural mm. revolution, and as I say since the Second World War, and it's been compounded, I think, by monetary policy and the, the monetarist uh, way that that, the that policy has been driven since the mid seventies, I guess, and what you know, arguably fueled Thatcher's Britain, what have you. 
But but actually, the default position going back pre-industrial agriculture revolution is for deflation. Yeah, you know, you, you take people is out. Is that of, a technolo- impact of technology? Right. Is deflation and and and, and the, the one that always springs to mind. And I actually took the bother of looking it up, but I think it's Moore's law that relates to computing power yeah. and what what we now have in the palm of our hands. And so you end up with more power at less cost. Mm. That that is not inflationary. So. Any any sort of consumable thing, whether it's electricity or food, what have you, yeah, we get these periods. But fundamentally, life I think is more affordable today than it was fifty years ago. But well, presumably, you've got periods of big inflation, and then someone, some bright spark comes along and goes, the, "It shouldn't cost this much for this good or this service," and develops a good or a service that is available at more competitive price, and that is deflationary. Uh, right, and and, and just that, logically, yeah. But if you think back through living memory, there is there are very few people alive who would have recalled, apart from in Japan, of course, where mm. deflation has been a thing. Mm. Um, but yeah, we get very fixated on short, relatively short-term price inflation, and yet mm. through the lens of history, deflation is actually now whether that will persist, I don't know. But my hunch is that we'll still be able to buy better stuff at lower cost. 10 years from now than, than we can today. Yeah, well, I, would agree. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. It's just how long that this goes on. It's, it's just been a weird environment. And I don't think, well, we're, we will never find out, but but for 2020 and everything that happened, there's no reason to believe that we would have seen the sort of environment that we've seen over the last year and a half. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a, going back to your point about deflationary periods, it's, you know, although inflation is recorded at a level, everyone has a better standard of living today and has more stuff than our parents did, our grandparents did. You know, we've all been offered, think about that antique furniture that your mum or grandma offered mm-hmm. you when you bought your first house and you didn't want it because... I'll get, it, I'll get the Ikea stuff, thanks. Yeah. It's exactly <laughs> that, but but it's, oh, when we were that age, you know, we couldn't afford furniture. We had to take whatever it was. And there is, our, our, the earnings power or, or, or our money goes further today than it ever has done. Uh, y- yes, although I think a lot of the current narrative, particularly in politics, is that the, 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 the generation that's sort of coming through today mm. is potentially going to be the first generation in whatever, four or five, where that won't be, that may not be true. Okay. Where that standard of living, arguably, in the, and again, we, we've got... Not be able to own houses and right. things like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, t- time will Sometimes tell. Will, yeah. <laughs> At the same time, in the next whatever it is, I'm going to make it up and say 20 years, 30 years. But you know, we've also got this massive intergenerational transfer of wealth coming as well. So, what impact is that going to have? I don't know. Well, we're all living longer as well. And to your point about financial education, Charlie, there's. You know, there's going to be a need for money to last a wee bit longer than it has done historically. Mm. So the more that people know about their money and how to make their money sweat for them is is a good thing. I mean, the thing, my issue with this is the finance industry is the only, only industry in the world that seems to regard living longer as a risk. <laughs> I generally think of not dying as being quite a good thing, but not the finance industry. Do you mean sort of from a an annuity slash life insurance slash well, you sit down, sit down in front of a client and one of the very typical questions is am I going to have enough to be able mm-hmm. to do what I want to do for the rest of my life and ultimately if you live for much longer that money is going to have to last a wee bit longer mm-hmm. you know, didn't have retirement plans in the 20s or 30s just dropped dead in the field right <laughs> <laughs> yeah but they did in all that but there are a number of things about that, aren't there? And you know, if you if you speak to someone in their twenties, say to them, right, you should start planning for your retirement. Yeah. How, how much are you going to need in retirement? Mm. I don't know how much you're going to need next week, let alone no. in retirement. So it's quite a nebulous concept. And I think for you know, projecting for but you know, for a fifty year old, it's still quite a nebulous concept. We don't know what's going to happen. That, that <clears throat> lack of clarity, I think, to your point earlier, almost puts people off a wee bit making any sort of decision. Well, but also the grim reality of having to face up to your own mortality. Because basically you're asking 
when do you think you're going to die? What do you want to do before you die? And at what point do you think you're going to need money to pay for care? Mm. And these are these are not cheerful questions. Cheerful, but not so sure. And, and by the way, they're questions that you can't answer either. No. So it's all kind of like on a best endeavors type basis. But yeah, it's one of the thing that one of the things that baffles me slightly about government pension policy, for example. Yeah. And I know they've recently changed it and they've removed lifetime allowance and what have you. And I can't recall exactly what one can now put in on an annual basis, but if governments were incentivized and encouraged to think multi-generationally or in, in decades rather than in parliamentary election cycles, the logical thing surely would be to encourage people to be pumping money into their pensions as efficiently as possible totally so that they don't then have to rely on the state. Mm. And, yeah. and yet, of course, they don't, not least because um, it's quite cheap political capital to... Chip away so, soak yeah. the rich and no, and I, I get that I'm not but in terms of managing the, the the country's finances and the to your point about an aging population massive liability in the balance sheet right for an NHS that's already mm. under huge pressure partly because it was and partly because of of the the COVID fallout of course um, we haven't got enough care homes we haven't got enough people to work in care homes. Um, yeah, I mean, the next 20, 30 years could be quite interesting as, as people get older, they live for longer. As, I mean, this is cheerful stuff, isn't it? Well, more people are going to need to make more decisions about their financial life now than yeah. they would have done 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. So people mm. 30, 40 years ago didn't have a student loan. Um, they could get a mortgage. They knew what they needed to save. They had building societies and savings accounts. Fine. Yeah. And then they typically had to find benefit pensions and the state pension, and that was the end game. Whereas today... In the financial world is more complicated and we've talked about you know mortgages student loans you know life insurance things like car insurance and then you know those clients get to 40 50 55 when the kids are a little bit older mm. and now they've realized they've worked at six different places in their career and they've got a yeah. lot of pension pots scattered mm. around and they realize they want to retire in 15 20 years and there's no there's no defined benefit so they've now got to make another decision about yeah where's my money um which and then they get to which retirement they, which they're no better equipped no better equipped to at make. All. So, you know, substantial numbers of people have to make pretty big decisions about their future all the way through in comparison to the same people 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And they've got to hope the system, when it comes to the investment side of it, does work. That, 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 that general upward trajectory that we've seen in asset prices, mm -hmm. the, the things that people invest in over the last whatever it is, 200 years, the sake of argument, actually persists. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, probably unsurprising given I'm a stocks guy, but I'll take that bet. But I think the issue with the pensions is well, there's twofold. One, there's potentially going to be a trend to make it less desirable to invest in a pension, but also I think that as damaging is potentially changing the rules so often. Mm. No, hugely. Mm. That totally is hugely damaging yeah. because there will be people who go, oh, I can't be bothered with this yeah. and throw their hands up the And then the, the Make, not making a decision, as you said, Charlie, is, is more dangerous than actually making a yeah. decision. Yeah. This is something you must see in the you know, offering a platform which helps people make decisions around financial products and things. There's this idea that more choice is a better thing. Mm. I don't want to look at 150 pairs of jeans. <laughs> I want to look at five pairs and make a decision. Yeah, and in the case of jeans, you want to make that decision and that'll be your jeans for the next... Years, well, I'll make that decision and then Mrs. maybe H maybe tweak maybe yeah. tweak the size slightly <laughs> Over occasionally the years. If, if you have to, but but broadly speaking, yeah, um, yeah, I, th I think I think choice is helpful up to a point, but give people too many things to look at, even if it's just in one particular product vertical, they just get a snow blindness. Yeah. Um, plus, you know, courtesy of the um, the aggregators, the comparison engines, we're all conditioned to select on one metric and one metric alone now, which is price. And yet, there's a reasonable chance that the one that's eight down is actually Best fit. The, the better product for you. But the one that, that people will pick is the one that's at the top because it says mm. it's 220 quid, not 280 quid. And, you know, home insurance is a classic example. And I think you could probably speak to this where. You, you buy that policy and it's it looks like it does what it says in the tin and then 
heaven forbid you need to make a claim and it turns out the policy doesn't do what you need to do. No, but, no, but what, 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 have, what have you been claiming for? Oh, everything. Roofs, mate. Don't, have don't, don't have a dodgy roof. It's God. very expensive. But with the right policy, which probably costs a little bit more, and, but... Probably be fine. Right. Yeah. Possibly. It's, it, yeah, I mean, it's difficult, but I just think there's this general principle of, you know, we need to give people more and more and more and more an investment. Exactly the same. It's mm. never been easier to inv- uh, access mm. investment options. And that is hugely positive, I think, net. But it just means you just can be just overwhelmed, but even as a starter. Yeah. But what do you mean by investment options? Do you mean products like ISAs versus pensions versus GIA versus investment bonds? Providers. Or- Okay. So if you if you're just setting up a simple taxable mm. account, you have got a number. If you were just to Google investment platform, yeah, investment strat, you know, robo advisor, whatever you want to call it, there are lots of options out there, and that I think is a net positive because it gets people on the journey. But uh, well, there's a danger of being becoming very confused. Yeah, I mean, I think competition created by that choice is probably. A a net positive for the consumer but if I was a lay person in the context of not having had the career that I've had I've got no idea how I'd go about selecting no. the investment provider the wrapper or product type strategy <laughs> like what, what you know, and then yeah. I've got to invest the money mm. oh and by the way to get to that point I probably had to fill in 30 questions just to get the right to give someone money to invest that I don't know what to do with yeah I mean it, it's a minefield um, but the same is true across a, you know, most financial yeah, products. Yeah. Mm. And if you know, in, in the lending space, the mortgages, insurances, and so on, if you know, if you are lucky enough to have the right customer profile to get all the choice, mm. it's not necessarily that lucky. Whereas at the other end of that sort of income or creditworthiness spectrum, actually, there isn't choice. You, you, you get the one you're accepted on. You don't care about rate. It's like, I can get that Ticket. two grand. And you don't care because you'd love to get the two grand from HSBC at whatever it would have been. 7% yeah. today probably. But you're kind of stuck with the subprime stuff because that's where you can get. You're a force bar and then you're on a, a different mm. kind of journey. Right. Um, it would be remiss, I think, not to mention the fact we've had a we've had a couple of inflation prints since since we last recorded a pod, um, which were deemed good news in inverted commas by the market. So we've got UK inflation here, which is finally seemingly starting to roll over, and and John, you sent across the chart as well of of two year interest rates, which, if you squint, you'll see are starting to come down there, the blue line as well. Um, we've mentioned a bit that the consumer is under pressure during the cost of living and how much people are feeling it in their pockets. Where's the recession? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a slight nuance to this as well, don't forget, because for a couple of years we couldn't do anything. You couldn't go to the pub, you couldn't go to the cinema, you couldn't go on holiday. You couldn't even go to the supermarket. I mean, you could, obviously, but I, I think there's been a bit of a not a bit I think it's been a lot of a, a, like a, a bounce back a backlash as it were where people just will they want to do anything and everything because now they're allowed to again so I think that's partly behind it um, I think I think people in certain areas have started to make different decisions um, but in terms of the I mean, past I don't know the, the evidence isn't there yet it's kind of like a bit of a, a bit of a phantom recession at the moment, isn't it? Um, it? It is a bit. I mean, it feels like we should be having one, but most people are going out and spending money and probably goes back to the debt chart we showed a little while ago. Probably quite a lot of it is on tech and you didn't get a family holiday a couple of years ago, so you're going to go for a couple in the last 12 months. Well, and, it, and it, if we maybe we'll go back to it, but but that one that looked at the um, the consumer credit over the last couple of years, where well, we had the, that one there, yeah, where we we dropped off, and you know, mm. people are accessing liquidity back to pre-pandemic levels. But bal- it was the weirdest recession of all time because actually balance sheets, personal consumer balance sheets, ended up in better shape after twenty twenty. That blink and you miss it recession. I mean, the, the government wore the recession. 
it shifted, <laughs> yeah. essentially shifted yeah. cash. Damage from, damage yeah, it shifted its bank, you know, it's, it's, it's cash to consumers and, and, you know, UK people. I, I think there's, I, I think none of us anticipated such a long lag because I don't think, although we knew there was excess savings, I think when you when you do what we do, we always think things or, or pricing always adjusts much quicker than people's wallets. And you've had that rundown of savings, and then the build up of debt, and then it's maybe it doesn't take eighteen months for a knock on effect of a rate increase. Maybe it's slightly longer because everyone's on slightly longer fixed rate mortgages. I think that's it's just everything. It just just feels like a longer lag, doesn't there, to it this time, and we just keep sitting here waiting. But don't forget the employment market is. Still tight. pretty tight, yeah, yeah. and I don't have the stats to hand, but my my suspicion is that um, the number of vacancies out there is still quite high. Mm. Um, ironically, a lot of that is in I should probably l lower paid jobs that we used to rely on migrant workers yeah. or, or or people from other parts of Europe in particular to come and do. Um, Long term sick, we talked about a lot, yeah. haven't we? There's there's a smaller smaller labour force. You, yeah. you, you um, presumably are, well, I don't know if you're hiring, but you'll have first-hand experience of what the employment market's like. Um, well, yes. I mean, obviously, what we, we have tended to focus on quite specialised type Jobs. roles, particularly in technology or psychology or um, financial advice. Again, I don't have concrete evidence but anecdotally, that's mad. There's no need for concrete evidence on this. It's just all has, I, you know. Ha, had we been looking to hire technologists of most flavors a year or more ago, yeah, like sellers market, like you, you'd have to pay up this that and the other. Mm. Now, if we were looking to to hire technologists, I think we would find it a little bit easier and not as expensive as it was because there is there is. A reasonable amount of capacity mm. in that space. That said, if you're in AI or high-end data science or machine learning, I think there is a reasonable demand for <laughs> for those sorts of specialisms. But there is also a real dearth of that sort of talent as well. The, what's the name of the guy that discovered the inversion of the yield curve, predicting recessions? Uh, Johnny Raymond, Callum. CFA. <laughs> <laughs> Callum. Callum. Oh, I, I always forget his name, yeah. so I doubt he's listening to this, but apologies if you are. Um, one of his theories on why there hasn't been a recession in the States is that the weakness is exactly that. The weakness that you've got in the job market is people who are highly skilled and they're not necessarily going to be able to work for a very long period of time. So if you got let go from, I don't know, Meta or Microsoft, chances are you're pretty you're employable. Right and yeah. you're going to go for, on yeah. holiday for a couple of months, three months, and then you're going to come back and you're going to have a job because you're a smart cookie. So you haven't seen that weakness at the lower end, and that's why the employment market, there's not loads of people looking for jobs out there at the moment. I didn't think that was terrible. No. On the job openings front, I think, John, was it you that was talking about, do we have this discussion that in the US, in the US, if you're a business, let's say, sitting in New York, because of COVID and hybrid working, you just want the best person there. You don't necessarily. New York's probably a bad example, but let's say, let's say you're California. You're, let's say California. You've now got that job opening posted to lots of different states, mm. and it's almost a multiple of those job openings. And actually, the jolts figure might be higher than it actually is because yeah. the algorithms behind it can't. They're, they're saying counting. it's double counting. Yeah, so the the job um, the job openings figures the the so called jolts that comes out every week every fortnight no, yeah. quite regularly, you know yeah. they are still elevated. I.e., there are loads of job openings available mm. per unemployed person, and there are nearly one point seven times the number of jobs advertised as there are unemployment peop unemployed mm. people. Unemployed people. So the job openings numbers are themselves, you know, not worth much lower. Yeah. Yeah. The the yeah. trend and the direction you can probably draw yeah. some conclusions yeah. from, yeah. but not the absolute numbers because, as you say, you know. If Court Achievia were hiring, the place goes on, goes on LinkedIn, goes yeah, on the website, yeah, yeah. goes yeah. on Read or whatever it is, Monster. It goes, you, you know, and that's kind of double, if not triple, counted. Mm. So, um, yeah, I totally agree with that. But it, it, it does sort of feel as though if you look at the JOLTS numbers in the States and some of the other kind of 
higher frequency data, it does sort of look like the jobs market is not quite as tight as it was three, six months ago. Well, I mean, if nothing else, you would hope that the action by central banks in the last, whatever it is, six, seven, eight months would have had some sort of an impact. Mm -hmm. Now, we could debate for quite some time, I suspect, whether the sort of the, the, the change in the numbers as far as inflation is concerned has had has actually been a, a function of uh, central bank no, action. Yeah. But by definition, particularly to your point, James, about mortgage rates and what have you, mm. people surely have less money in their pockets. Even with some pay increases that, that have yeah. been happening. Yeah, yeah well, well, wage growth has lagged general inflation for the last 18 months, two years. So yeah, well, in, in this country, in the public sector, oh, the public buy sector more for, for yeah. much longer. Yeah, mm. But, it, you know, the question we keep asking ourselves is rates have gone up from naught to 5.5%. And there have been some issues in financial markets, you know, Credit Suisse, Silicon Valley, Thames Water. You know, that's <laughs> a problem with trying to roll over their debt. The gilt market blow up post the mini budget last year. Mm. You know, we have had like mini tantrums. Which yeah. has all really been a result of a repricing. Yeah, and how did money. the Bank of England respond to the guilt thing? Well, they made they started they bought, bonds well, again. No, they like, bought a load of bonds overnight. and they made a load of money out. They made two billion out of that. So did they? Neat trade. Traders. Really neat trade. Um, but <laughs> you haven't really seen. I mean, <laughs> well, Hughes has done the trade. He did, this he, the only he's, man he's, he's to do better than the Bank of England. Curve. <laughs> I, I'm back. What I'm up you, about fifteen percent on it. It's a it's a sixty-one. A twenty sixty-one. Yeah. Conventional or index? Conventional. Half percent coupon. Paid about twenty four and sold it thirty three thirty four I think overnight. Overnight, that's a good thing. Called cool, cool Bailey. He's a hero. <laughs> He's a good hero. man. But you've you've not seen, you know. We keep talking about it on mm. pod, and we, we keep talking about it in our recent meetings. And we had I think there's since is there a danger of because what we do for a living, and to your point about pricing, it adjusts quicker. We just think this is going to reflect in the real economy much quicker than it does. Yeah, but probably. I I, I also think sort of related to the, the world that we operate in mm. or you guys operate in professionally and where we are based in London and the South East. Mm. I'm not so sure that things feel less recessionary or as unrecessionary in other parts of, mm. of the UK. Mm. I, I, again, I, I, I don't know, but... You know, we're, we're talking about headline figures and we're talking about our, our lived experiences of you know, living in South London or you know, mm -hmm. home counties, what have you. And yes, the pubs are full and people are going out and this, that and the other, but I'm not sure that's necessarily universally the case in the UK. Mm. No. And we've also got the point, and I think you've got the next the next, uh, next little tweet from someone called Bob Elliott. That yeah, this on is, an, this is good on an aggregate basis the increase in interest income that savers have received from the rise in interest rates is higher than the amount of extra interest that mortgage in America in the US. And that's, and that's because it resets much quicker on your savings rate. Presumably. Yeah, because mortgages haven't reset. So 50 or 75% of mortgages in the US are fixed below 4% and current mortgage rates are 7 So if you've got a 4% mortgage, you're not moving house, are you? Because you're locked in for 30 years. And your cash um, has gone from earning 1% to 5%. So, I mean, actually, so far, if you look at that, <coughs> technically speaking, rise in interest rates has had a positive impact on the economy because there's more money going into the economy. I, I, and there's another thing as well when we talk about financial education um, and loading up on credit cards and debt. I, I, I think, unfortunately, people don't make adjustments to their standard of living. Say, say my mortgage is up in six months' time and I know my rate is fixed at 1.5% today. And when I come to fix, I've got a rough idea, it's probably going to be 6%. I think, unfortunately, I think most people don't adjust their spending until they pay more in that one month. I, I genuinely think yeah, no, people I think right. are not prepared yeah. and are not are not tucking money away to cover it's that. It's hundred percent. It? And I've got some, I've had conversations with, with friends or, or, or friends of friends about this and these are quite smart people that, that know what's coming. They're just like, I'll worry about it when it goes out my bank account. But, and but that's, that's, that's scary. Mm. Yes, but it's also a very human 
response, isn't it? The why, if you know that your life is going to be less good in six months' time, why yeah, would you bring that forwards <laughs> voluntarily? It's probably why the seahorse is full opposite of course achievement people knowing <laughs> that the mortgages are going to reset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah. But you're, 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 you're exactly you're, right. You're, but you're, you're, you're applying a rational thought process to something mm. that I was sort of alluding to earlier that is fundamentally irrational. It's a bit like everyone wants to go on holiday. You know, I'm going to go on holiday this one last time. I'm not saving that money for my rent increase or my mortgage increase because this is one last hurrah with the family. And do you know what? Live for the moment. Mm. And when that happens, I'll deal with it another time. I think actually, but that's just behavioural, isn't it? It's and maybe the yeah. COVID experience of being sat at home for three yeah, a hundred percent. You know, yeah. we're going to live for the moment. Well, yeah, life is short and fragile, and yeah. And I say you, we're trying to apply a rational thought process to something that is yeah is fundamentally, fundamentally irrational. irrational. And, yeah, and, yeah, and visceral yeah. and they know it's coming and it'll be it's what I've described as that sort of that, that low level angst or that low level mm. like just like thing that's bothering you at the back of your mind and you know what it is you don't yeah, want to face yeah, up to yeah, it yeah. I'm just going to live my life and, Cross that bridge I, and I, also, I also think that we underestimate quite how resourceful or adaptable or flexible can be and when the time comes that mortgage rate has gone up and they have got less money in their pockets there will they a lot of people will have capacity in their financial lives mm. that they will go on that one holiday less or you know people will have a hierarchy of things that are, that are important and or, but they'll or, have to pay the mortgage because they probably don't want to be a force or, or it's one of those where actually if there's two people living at home and, and one isn't working maybe there's a job that and remember, we can work remotely now. Maybe there is a job that's taken up for a few hours every evening doing something remotely. There's lots of options. I mean, maybe that sort of thing happens. It's, yeah. Um, that is flex, you're right. Uh, 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 but but there, there is likely to be a knock-on effect because that means that the seahorse will have fewer people in it or people yeah. will go out for dinner twice a month rather than four times a month or eight times a month or they will... They'll they'll get that takeaway less. I mean, I, the sort of businesses that it's the discretionary spend businesses mm. that I suspect will start to suffer more. Equally, I I, I I will take the bet that your mortgage won't reset at six in six months' time. I think yeah, I'd agree with you. Uh, for what it's worth. I think that I think the banks acted too late. It was they always do. Late. Too much. I mean, one, with of, the, the wrong one, tools of, the one of the, the phrases we need to chuck in the bin is policy mistake because if I mean we do it every single time, so it's mm. never it, like we over tighten, we over loosen every single time. That's because we always have the wrong chancellor in place. Just well, governor, sorry, not chancellor. It's always just you're trying to drive by only looking in the rear view mirror, mm. which you, and you, the situation is changing. You picked on the wrong tools for the job, and that's a really interesting point, but. It's probably an unfair question to ask you, but which other tools do you think? <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right. I like which, see it which, coming which, like, oh. I mean, you set yourself up. This is a spicy wicket, isn't it? Like, um, um, well, yeah, because well, that is the interesting, but I completely agree. And we, I think we all well, completely like, agree with what you just it, said. It, it, so just going back to sort of a bit of further out history than pre-COVID and the response mm. to, to COVID, that, that sort of existential threat and I always laugh when we look at what bank balance sheets did during the COVID pandemic compared to what happened in the great financial crisis but um, during the great financial crisis there's always this chat about when you know when interest rates normalize and they're like a what does that actually mean yeah. and b even now despite everything we've been through and where rates are now it's still not what I historically would have considered normal yeah. where the reference point is that that's six percent uh, on base rate um, I always found it fundamentally illogical that people would be talking about the post financial crisis. People would talk about rate rises before they'd even started thinking about unwinding QE. And similarly, this time around, yeah, I, I, 
I don't know where they've got to in terms of unwinding QE, either here or in the States, in, in Europe, what have you, but, but I think that there is still a reasonable amount of liquidity in the system, courtesy of the QE. The Fed's balance sheet is enormous, and yet they've moved that 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 short that you know that short term rate very you know a long way very quickly. Yeah. Um, in terms of like the wrong tools, it, it felt a bit like a knife in a gunfight. <laughs> Capacity was taken out of the system. People couldn't buy stuff. People weren't making stuff because they, they didn't know when they were going to start buying stuff. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, demand comes back. Starting gun goes off. Demand comes back. Where's the stuff I want? Oh, the factory takes six months to get going again. You then get this sort of supply-demand imbalance. I don't think demand really got... I don't know where it is relative to pre-pandemic, but maybe it's greater, maybe it's less, but the, mm. it was the supply side that mm-hmm. that was the issue yeah, in yeah, so many yeah, instances, yeah. and yet they were using demand-side tools to fight it. To your question, I, I mean, I sort of feel like a Jimmy Anderson Beamer at David Warner. I'm going to like lean back and deflect it over <laughs> third man for six, but... I, you I would deflect have, I, it's your left if you want. I, I would have liked I would have liked them to do more in terms of unwinding yeah. QE yeah. and the balance sheet action before they started moving mm. interest rates. What I'd really like them to have done is something in twenty eighteen when they had the chance and mm. having told everyone they were going to and then yeah. didn't. Yeah. Anyway, Jonathan, what's your view? Well, uh, part of the reason we had inflation was you're right, demand was high relative to supply because supply was taken out, but. Demand was firm because, as we saw earlier, the government underwrote household balance sheets. Yeah. So household incomes held up very high. So on that basis, the fiscal stimulus of 2020, 2021 was a big factor in that jump in demand. And therefore, one way you could address that is by the reverse, is, is using fiscal policy and, and tax and spending to bring that money back out of the economy. That seems like a more sensible now. It's politically totally infeasible with an election on the horizon it just wasn't going to happen and they have time to a degree in the full corporation tax on, on, a, on a scale of one to ten balances. on a scale of one to ten how little are you two desperately wanting to avoid talking about politics next year oh we've got a US election we're going to get four UK episodes election, out of that at least uh, in, the, in, the, in the same month aren't we next year so that's going to be great <laughs> um, fellas that was great we're coming up on time um, and I'm gasping for a pint <laughs> Charlie Thank you so much for coming on. No, no, so thanks if for having people me. want to find out a little bit more about Money Guided, where can they go? Uh, moneyguided.com or Seems logical. <laughs> um, uh, or you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, Charlie at moneyguided.com. Brilliant. Nice one. I'm not going to put my phone number on this. Well, we'll have have it in the have it in the show notes. Yeah, we, uh, we could have carried that on for another five hours. Well, well we we're going to we the pub, we're won't we? To, <laughs> we'll do uh, we'll do shot after. That was but, yeah. I mean, slightly. Yeah, I got a bit negative at times. I felt the world was going to fall over during our conversation, but that no, was brilliant. Sorry about the uh, the the the, the death care dribbling wreck <laughs> combo. So I just, I just like, finish more, myself off at that point. For more positivity <laughs> like that, uh, tune in in a couple of weeks' time. Um, oh, we're still recording. Did, yeah, we're still yeah. recording. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's just us three maybe jumping out the window uh, next time around. But thank you for joining us, folks. Any questions, email me at david.henryacultachieviet.com and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.